Hey, bio people. It is time for us to study genetics, one of our favorite units. We're going to start with the work of Gregor Mendel. Gregor Mendel was a monk in, um, in Austria, and he, growing up, went to school at the local monastery where they noticed that he was a pretty bright young man, and they sent him off to the University of Vienna to study. And at the University of Vienna, he was influenced by a physicist who encouraged experimentation and the application of mathematics to science, and also a botanist who aroused Mendel's interest in the causes of variation in plants and the passing on of traits from the parent to the offspring. When he was finished at the university, Mendel taught at the Brunn Modern School and lived at the local monastery. The monks at this monastery had a long tradition of interest in breeding plants, including the peas. And in um, about 1857, Mendel began breeding garden peas to study this inheritance. He had become a monk and the monks had put him in charge of the abbey garden. So basically he had everything he needed in his daily workload. He started out breeding true breeding parent plants. So he allowed the plants to cross to um, self-pollinate till he knew that they were pure white or pure purple. He then could he then could control which pollen was entering which um, pistol. So he basically took half of the white flowered plants and half of the purple flowered plants and he removed the stamen the stamen are the male parts of the plant that produce the pollen, and he left behind the pistil, which is the female part of the plant. And the pistil's over here on this flower. By doing this, he was able to then take the pollen from the white flowers and put it into the purple, and from the purple into the white. So he was doing the, the cross-pollination in both directions, and he was able to determine that when he did this, his flowers all came out purple. So his first generation or first filial generation was 100% purple. Another reason this works well is that the shape of the flower for the pea encloses the male and female parts of the flower. So no pollen from outside could get onto that pistil. He had total control of that cross-pollination process. Once he um, studied the purples and he realized the whites were completely gone, he allowed the purples to self-pollinate and then he observed the flowers they produced for the F2 generation. When all was said and done, the self-pollination of the F1 generation, or what we call the hybrids, presented 75% purple flower peas and 25% white flowered peas for the F2 generation. This was a ratio of 3 to 1. Mendel repeated these, this process looking at seven different P traits, and he observed all of the traits separately and then later he went back and looked at them in pairs, but he noticed that um, he had a clear difference between the flower color, the flower, co the seed color, the seed shape, the pod color, the pod shape, the position of the flower on the plant, and the height of the plant. All of these had two choices only. There was no blending between the traits. So you didn't see any lavender flowers, you didn't see any medium high plants. Um, all of these things were an either or choice. So when he was going, looking at his data, he, was, he determined that um, some traits, the traits did not blend and some traits were masked by other traits. So for flower color, the purple always masked the white. This indicated that the purple was a dominant allele. Now at this point, he would not be using the word allele because he did not know about genes, chromosomes, or DNA. 
uh, but he did know about the physical traits of the flower and the inheritance of this trait. It turns out that the dominant allele is what we call the functional protein, which is going to give you that purple color, and that the recessive allele is a non-functioning protein, so it does not give you a purple color, basically gives you no color, which makes it the flower white. These are homologous chromosomes, so remember from meiosis, homologous chromosomes are the same shape, the same size, and they carry the same genetic information. However, they're not identical. They carry the same genes, but not necessarily the same alleles for these genes. So if this gene is flower color, this allele is for purple, and this allele is for white. And the and one of them is dominant over the other. So Mendel's law of dominance says that in a heterozygote or a hybrid, one allele will conceal the presence of another allele for that trait or gene. A, for example, a tall plant allele consider, conceals the short plant allele. The purple flower color allele conceals the white flower color allele. The traits are inherited as discrete units. What that means is that there is a gene for every trait, and each gene has choices for that trait, and those choices are the alleles. In diploid organisms, there are two sets of chromosomes that you get one set from each parent. Remember, back to meiosis again. Um, you're getting one half of your uh, chromosomes from mom and one half of your chromosomes from dad. They're homologous, so they are a matching set of the same shape, size, and same genetic information. So it's sort of like having two editions of an encyclopedia. They're going to cover the same information. They might just cover it in a slightly different way. So genotype versus phenotype. Genotype um, tells you where the genes are. Your phenotype is the difference about how an organism looks. So what is the physical manifestation of that gene? What do you see? So phenotype is physical. Your genotype is like what actual genes does this organism have? What is the genetic makeup? What alleles do they have? So um, if you had to explain Mendel's results using dominant and recessive and phenotype and genotype, you should be able to do that by the time we're done with this lesson. Here, your phenotype is purple or white, and your genotype will be dominant versus recessive. So when we're doing crosses, we use a sort of shorthand, and we're going to use, generally, it's the first letter of the dominant phenotype. So P here would represent purple flower color. So true breeding purple flowers are going to be dominant P, dominant P. We don't say big and little P because that's not clear information. Dominant P, dominant P tells me that we have dominant alleles. If it's a true breeding white flower, then we do recessive P, recessive P. And when you cross the two, you get the heterozygous or hybrid combination of dominant P, recessive P. Now, in order to predict what possible outcomes a cross could have, and it's possible outcome, we don't always get the exact ratio that this predicts, but Punnett squares were developed to look at the alleles from the different organisms and see what crossing those two organisms might lead to. So we take one parent, so on this one it's the male is up here, and the female is over here. Remember, each of these had one dominant P and one recessive P, so we take one dominant P and one recessive P 
on this side of the square and one dominant P and one recessive P on this side of the square. Then we're just going to bring our letters into the different boxes to see the possible combinations of alleles that could occur if these two parents were crossed. So when we do that, we get what we say, what we call homozygous dominant or dominant P, dominant P, dominant P, recessive P, dominant P, recessive P, heterozygous, and recessive P, recessive P, or homozygous recessive. So when you look here, these are all going to look purple, and that's because they all have one dominant P. These over here, I'm sure you can guess, are going to be white. So if you look at the ratio in genotype, we have 25% homodominant, 50% heterozygous, and 25% homorecessive. This gives us a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. If we look at the phenotype, what they look like, we get 75% um, purple and 25% white. And that gives us a 3 to 1 ratio. And these ratios are pretty standard every time you cross the F1 generation hybrids, otherwise known as the heterozygotes. When you cross them, you should be getting very close to this ratio every time. Homozygous means the same alleles. So homo literally means the same. So homozygous individuals have the same alleles. They either have two dominants or two recessives. The heterozygous, hetero means different. So the heterozygous have one of each. So here we have our homozygous dominant with the double, double dominant P's, homozygous recessive with two recessive P's, and then here are the heterozygotes, which are one dominant and one recessive. So this ratio is one to two to one, see? And this ratio is three to one, three purples, oops, sorry, three purples for every one white. Two organisms have the same phenotype but have different genotypes. So what will they look like? They're going to be purple and one of them is going to be homozygous dominant and the other one is going to be heterozygous. You cannot tell by looking at this flower which one is homozygous and which one is heterozygous. You can sometimes tell after you cross one of these guys with a white flower because if white flowers show up in the offspring, then the, the parent had to be heterozygous. If you don't get white flowers in the offspring, then you don't have, you don't have a white allele in the parent. So this data led Mendel to come up with his first law of heredity. This is the law of segregation. Segregation means to separate. So during meiosis, alleles will segregate or separate. And the, um, the homologous chromosomes will separate. So remember in meiosis, you have homologous chromosomes separating and then sister chromatids separating. So both ways, you are separating your alleles into different packages uh, for the new cells. So we, if you have two dominant alleles, you don't really have a choice. Your gametes are going to both have this allele. If you're homozygous recessive, same thing. These two gametes are both going to be recessive. But if you're heterozygous, half of your uh, gametes will show the dominant and half of your gametes will have the recessive allele. So when they line up, remember the, the um, tetrad formation, they line up together in metaphase, and then they are pulled apart in anaphase, and the way, and the fact that they are pulled apart is separating these alleles from each other. The second round of meiosis, I'm now going to separate the sister chromatids, and the sister chromatids are going to be found in the different offspring cells, 
and they will be fertilized and a second chromosome from the other parent will come in and those two alleles will interact based on what comes in. So if it's recessive and a dominant allele joins, then you'll see the dominant trait. But if it's um, recessive and another recessive allele comes in, you'll see the recessive trait. So it, all of this, the major part of segregation is happening in metaphase one, where we are separating the two sister, the um, two homologous chromosomes into two different spots. And you also have segregation again down here. But if, you're, if these guys are identical, then you're going to get identical groups down here. But we know, because we've already studied this, that we can have crossing over happening up here, and that will definitely affect the way our alleles are segregated. And remember, Mendel's coming up with this law of segregation before he knows anything about DNA or genes. In fact, I'm pretty sure he never knew about DNA and genes because he passed away before we really started studying them. So the, um, there are a couple of different types of crosses to look at. A monohybrid cross is going to look at one trait. So in this one, we're looking at flower color. And the flower color choices are purple and white, purple dominant and white recessive. We can also look at seed color um, or seed shape or any of those other seven traits that we mentioned earlier. These are called monohybrid crosses because we are crossing the offspring of two purebred individuals. So we know we have a pure, um, a pure purple and a pure white to start with, and then we take their seeds, the ones they produce, and that gives us our monohybrid cross. A dihybrid cross is going to look at two traits at the same time. <clears throat> His, um, he had enough peas and enough e experimental time to look at combinations of traits to see what would happen. So he looked here at seed color and seed shape, which kind of makes sense since you're looking at one thing and looking at two traits. These are yellow peas. These are green peas. Some of them are smooth and some of them are wrinkled. Yellow peas actually are dominant over the green peas, but I guess nobody really liked eating yellow peas, and so we don't grow those. You can't really find yellow peas in a grocery store. So these gave us our dihybrid crosses. So all of these experiments that Mendel was doing helped us to figure out the rules for all of this stuff. So when he's looking for the two traits at once, he starts out with true breeding um, plants. So this plant is true breeding for yellow and round. So it has two dominant alleles for yellow, two dominant alleles for round. This is a true breeding recessive. It has true breeding for green and true breeding for wrinkled. So this is what their gametes look like or their cells look like. Their gametes, we have to determine, only get one of each allele, right? So if the gamete gets one Y and one R, you have to determine how they are going to divide. Well, if it's purebred, you really only have one choice, okay? You get um, a dominant Y from this parent and a recessive Y from this parent, and a dominant R from this parent and a recessive R from this parent. So all of these offspring are going to be the same, and they're going to have that genotype. If we let them self-pollinate, so remember, we, we did the hybrid cross in the Punnett square, and our ratios before were 1 to 2 to 1 and 3 to 1. So here we're going to now look at two of these crossing, and we have four options for we have four possible combinations. So our first combination is yellow and round. The second one is green and round. Then we could be yellow and wrinkled or green and wrinkled. When he did this experiment, nine out of 16 times he had yellow round peas. 
three out of 16 times, he had green and round peas. So this is the recessive trait. This is the dominant trait. Three out of 16, he had yellow, which is dominant, and wrinkled, which is recessive. And then one out of 16, he had the, the green wrinkled peas, which are both recessive traits. This gives us a ratio of nine to three to three to one. If genes are on the di are on different chromosomes, okay. So what what's happening here? Why are we getting these these combinations? So if your genes are on different chromosomes, the way they move from one cell to another while the while metaphase is happening is separate because they're on two separate chromosomes, and so one cannot control what the other one is doing in any way. <clears throat> So if, if one is not controlling the other, do they, do they assort together or independently? Does it look like this, where all of your alleles or all of your um, gametes are going to be double dominant or double recessive? Or does it look like this, where you have a combination of uh, two recessives, the recessive with the dominant, the dominant with the recessive, or the two dominants. These were his choices and he was trying to figure out how this could be happening. So again, this is one option. So if we cross that, and remember, each one of these is a gamete, right? So it's an egg or a sperm. And then they're going to cross and come into the boxes and rejoin in pairs, like that, like we did before. So when that happens, you bring down the two dominants, Y and R, and you always, when you are writing these, you always put your letters together. You put your Ys together, you put your Rs together. It's also like writing your name, you always put the dominant letter first. So Y's together, R's together, and then dominant letter, then recessive, dominant, and then recessive. Okay, so the combinations we got here, these are all dominant alleles, these are all recessive alleles, and here we have a combination to, of um, dominant recessive and dominant recessive, or heterozygous. And here's heterozygous. So is this what's going on? If this is what's going on, we should see a 3 to 1 ratio. He didn't see a 3 to 1 ratio. He saw a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. So this can't be what we're looking for. that doesn't match. So what if we try this combination? So now we need extra boxes because we've got four different combinations for our gametes. And how do I determine how my gametes combine these alleles? How do these alleles get put into each of these gametes? Well, I don't know if you remember algebra, but there's a method in algebra that comes in handy here. It's called FOIL. So to get these gametes, you do first, outside, inside, and last. First, outside, inside, and last. So the first is the two dominants. The outside is dominant Y, lower, uh, recessive R, foil F. The inside is recessive Y, dominant R, and the last is the two recessives, Y and R. So now again, Punnett square, we're dropping everybody into the boxes, and this is what we're going to wind up with. Okay, so these are the different combinations that we get from these four 
options of gametes, of alleles in the gametes. Remembering that we only have four options here, so the possible combination is only four. The, since this and this are the same, these gametes come out the same, or these possible gametes come out the same. So when we have this, now we have yellows, wrinkles, greens, green wrinkles. So now if you count these up, these are all yellow round. So that's nine yellow round. You got three yellow wrinkled, three green round, and one green wrinkled. So that has to be the right method. Okay, so that has how our dihybrid cross works. Doing this dihybrid cross, Mendel came up with his second law of heredity, which is the independent assortment law. So different genes separate into the gametes independently because they're on different loci, which means locations. They are on different chromosomes, so they are not attached to one another. So they're going to divide and separate during meiosis independently of one another. Okay, so having this combination, I could get these four gametes, or I can get these four gametes. Okay, so you see here, the cha it changes based on the different options. So your non-homologous chromosomes are going to align independently in metaphase, they're going to separate independently in anaphase. It's, this is only going to be true for genes on separate chromosomes or on the same chromosome but so far apart that crossing over happens very frequently between them. So if the chromosomes are on the same, if the genes, sorry, are on the same chromosome, they're going to be moving together more often so you're not going to get this independent assortment. So that would be the exception. If they're on the same chromosome and they're close together like this, you are not going to get crossing over to happen very often here. So you can see crossing over happens when the genes are far apart. You're going to get lots of crossing over happening in between them, and it may appear like they are on different chromosomes. But if the genes are this close together on a chromosome, the likelihood of crossing over happening in between them very often is very small. And so we say that they are linked because they are moving together on the same chromosome. They are physically linked because they are physically on the same chromosome. Okay, so just a reminder, this is all, this all traces back to our study of meiosis. A review, so just to remind yourself, we, had, we visited three laws today. The law of dominance, which says that one trait will mask another. The law of segregation, which is looking at a single trait in a monohybrid cross. Each allele is going to segregate into separate gametes, and that's going to happen by metaphase one. Independent assortment, we're looking at dihybrid or more crosses. You can look at three or four traits if you really want to. Um, these genes are on separate chromosomes. They're going to assort into the gametes independently. And that's going to also be established by metaphase 1. And again, that exception is if they are linked, then that's not going to work. So Mendel chose peas, and he chose peas because they were there, and he also understood their structure. So it made it it made a very made for a very good choice for him. So they had many varieties with distinct features. So flower color, seed color, seed shape, all those things we talked about. Mendel had strict control over which plants mated with which plants because he could control the cross-pollination. And then he also got lucky because um, they're very simple plants genetically. Most of their characters are controlled by a single gene and with that single gene only having two choices. There's no blending here, so there's no confusion. It was very easy for him to say yes it's purple or no it's white so he got he didn't think about that part that just happened to be a good deal so 
hopefully you have learned a little bit about genetic crosses and a little bit about Mendel. And I look forward to talking to you for the next lesson. Remember to fill in those note takers, please.